<laughs> okay, so I think our today's speaker uh, needs no introduction, not least because we actually invited her to speak at her last talk at this <laughs> seminar, which was not too, too long ago. Um, but obviously, you know, Julia Hilner, from, uh, who's professor of history at Sheffield University and, or the University of Sheffield. The yeah, yeah. Stop me. forgive me. Yeah, sorry. About, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, exactly. The um, but uh, who is one of our finest late antiquarians here in the UK, I will say, um, and, uh, and ha is speaking, I think, as part of a project that she, uh, I think more than one project, actually, but, but I think the work comes from the biography of the Empress Helena that, that uh, Yulia has been commissioned to write by OUP. And my understanding is that she found a lot more than she expected to when she started yes. to work on this. So I think we will benefit from that fact today. Uh, so without further ado, I'm uh, still slightly looking at the door, uh, I will, uh, I'll hand over to Yulia uh, on the women of the Tetrarchy. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. And um, well, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you also for the social media advert. Uh, if you came on the back of that, I hope you won't be disappointed. Um, where I was kind of uh, well, you know, equally introduced um, so nicely by Kate. Um, yeah, yes, I'm writing a book about, about Helena, the mother of Constantine, uh, which is quite a challenge uh, because um, there are no documents written by Helena. Um, from her life, and uh, there are actually no texts talking about her from her lifetime. Um, so all the texts uh, are written after she died. Um, but I guess uh, I like a challenge, and I took this challenge on um, that OUP put to me. And um, so I thought, you know, how, how do I go on about it? So you know, obviously the first thing I did was take out of the library um, this um, uh, wonderful book. Uh, which is the most the book that most people go to uh, when they want uh, something on Helena and certainly you know those who uh, read English um, by Jan Wilhelm Drivers, um, the mother of Constantine the Great and the Legend of her finding of the True Cross and um, as the title says it's actually a book in two parts one is a kind of a short biography and one is the other part is um, the Legend of the True Cross, uh, which um, is actually a legend because um, Helena didn't find the True Cross, or at least I think she didn't. Uh, but I also think uh, uh, Driver thinks she didn't, so you know that's not a very controversial uh, opinion to have. Um, but he also writes a little bit about her uh, life, and then on page fifty-five, I stumbled over the sentence <laughs> where he said, "The most memorable event of Helena's life was her journey to Palestine and the other eastern provinces." undertaking when she was well into old age. And that made me kind of stop and think, is this true? Is this really the me most memorable uh, event of Helena's life? And it made me sus suspicious. And last weekend, I actually acted on this suspicion. And I asked my mum, um, who is 84, um, what is the most memorable event of your life? And my mum said this. <coughs> So she said, the most memorable event of my life is the birth of my eldest child, so my older sister. And, um, and it wasn't kind of some trip she took on behalf of my dad last year, uh, but you know, it was something that was a lot earlier in her life. And, um, and hence kind of, um, she had this suspicion already that you know, we cannot really reduce Helena's life to this just one thing that happened at the end of it. Uh, but we have to spend a little bit of time, you know, with the 80 years that came um, beforehand. Um, and, uh, and that's what I, what I uh, then set out uh, to do, um, mainly to show that, you know, human lives are complex and many things happen. And, uh, um, and also, uh, you know, when Helena was younger, she actually didn't know she was going to Jerusalem and, and find the true cross, so we need to uh, take that seriously. So um, I did read a little bit about biographical theory, and then I adopted an approach that biographers uh, call writing a life forward, which kind of just basically means writing it in chronological order, uh, but um, kind of more um, interestingly means doing the research stage by stage, um, and really not thinking about uh, what came after, because 
Helena didn't know what came after. Um, so, you know, taking it as a, a step um, at a time. Um, and it's actually not that difficult because when I started writing, I actually wrote 10,000 words before I got to the birth of Constantine. Uh, so, you know, there are things you can say about Helena that um, are not just about, um, not even just about her being the mother of, um, of Constantine. Okay. Um, now, uh, while I, uh, you, when you do that, uh, you know, you move forward and obviously there are gaps in someone's life and, um, and that, can, that approach kind of tries to fill all these gaps with some kind of uh, you know, information about a life. Um, that's always difficult, uh, but it's certainly difficult for um, Helena. <laughs> Uh, because there are gaps in her life, as I will show uh, in a minute. Um, but it's all actually also quite difficult for women generally writing about women. But writing a biography about a woman is very, very difficult um, because women don't have a life cycle uh, that is gapless. Usually, you know, a lot of women spend time supposedly doing nothing, like having children, or you know, not kind of partaking in public life. Um, and hence don't leave these records. Um, so biographers actually have thought a lot about that and, and there are lots and lots of interesting um, approaches to uh, you know, how, you know, how to overcome this um, um, expectation uh, that a life has to be a, you know, a full cycle that you can actually write um, in this way. Um, but for Helena um, in particular, um, there is a massive gap in her life. Um, because uh, now she was born uh, around 248. Um, then uh, she did have Constantine. So these are kind of facts of her life that are you know more or less uncontroversial. Um, so she had Constantine in around 272 um, when she was 24, or circa 24, and then aged 40, her partner, uh, who was Constantine's dad, uh, Constantius, um, leaves her to marry uh, the stepdaughter or daughter, I actually think daughter, of um, the emperor uh, Maximian. Okay, so you can write up to that date, you know, relatively easily, not so easily, but relatively easily. But then, she, you know, Helena disappears uh, for 30 years. And then in 318, when she's aged 70, um, she reappears uh, at Constantine's court, um, and then all these things happen that people usually talk about uh, when they talk about Helena. She's met Augusta, she makes this trip uh, to all around the Eastern Mediterranean, but you know, certainly to Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and then she dies, and she's, um, uh, she's, she's buried, um, and we know where. Um, so, you know, so you can write that part, and you can write that part, but what do you do with those 30 years in the middle of 30 years, you know, for any life is a really, really long time. And, you know, other people who have talked about Helena have tried to fill these 30 years with imagination, uh, which is certainly a biographical um, method and not, you know, and not a bad one. Um, but often, because we know a lot about Constantine in that time, um, the imagination revolves around him and particularly his love for his mother and how he hadn't forgotten her and how as soon as he could, he brought her back to Trier, for example, where he resided. There is no evidence whatsoever for this, uh, and I didn't particularly want to do that. Um, but, you know, I want, you know, I do want to write this life forward, uh, so I have to kind of talk about this gap um, in some way. Um, so, um, for all my doubts that um, about kind of writing a life as a as a gapless cycle, you can actually sort of do that uh, with Helena um, when uh, you look at the topography of her life and their kind of help arrived to um, overcome this gap. Oh, you know, I got an idea, you know, how to fill this gap in her life. So when you look at her kind of spatial experience, if you want to uh, call it uh, like that, um, uh, you, know, you can put all the places that are associated with her uh, on a map, and then voila, a cycle appears, uh, which kind of basically goes all around uh, the Mediterranean. Because these are the geographical locations um, so that, that she's associated with. 
And uh, obviously a lot of them are disputed, uh, but another thing I've learned about biography writing is uh, that you're always advised to make a judgment and move forward, because otherwise it all becomes about the debate between modern historians, and that isn't particularly, um, you know, that doesn't give a subject uh, of, of a biography um, justice. So on that note, to stay with the subject, Helena, I decided <coughs> to travel to all these places to get a sense of, um, you know, what she might have experienced, you know, maybe a little bit against uh, hope. Um, but to some extent, this has actually worked um, because um, now, if, because a lot of people have talked about the end of her life and at the end of her life, she was in Rome, she was in Jerusalem, you know, big uh, central symbolic places um, at the time. But when you think about that, there were 80 years beforehand, and think about these places, you realize quite quickly that the majority of her life was lived not at the center of the Roman Empire, but on the periphery. And, um, and also in the third century, which, which is another kind of important um, thing um, to remember. And um, so she was born in, uh, probably, probably in Dra uh, um, Drapanon on the um, Propontis, so the southern, uh, uh, shore with the Sea of Mamre, and then as uh, so she was born there, probably um, it's now a village, it was then a village, and it's still a village, it's called Hasek now, um, and only Constantine turned it into a city, but it was a kind of a failed city, it didn't work really well, uh, so it was a village, she came from a village, in my mind, um, and then uh, somehow she um, ended up in Nysus, uh, which is niche in southern Serbia, where she gave birth to Constantine, so we know he she was there, he was born there, he must have been there. Um, we, you know, it's not entirely clear how she actually uh, ended up there. And, um, but then she was obviously with Constantius, and Constantius at some point became governor of Dalmatia. And because um, our historians tell us that when he married Theodora, he left Helena, she must have been with her up to that point, you know, he probably took her to Salona, or that's what I think. Um, so you have already kind of a nice uh, uh, trip uh, there, which I did. And, uh, and one thing I kind of realized was that this movement must have broadened Helena's horizons because Dapanon was a village, uh, Nysus is a town, or was a town of Monikipium, uh, but it's very small, it's a frontier town, uh, you can walk around in an hour, um, it's, you know, it was dominated by, you know, the, the kind of, um, the city elites were, like, the veterans who had been settled in the area. So a quite small town world. And then Salona um, was a very, very big city, a big, you know, in, in the Roman sense, like 60,000 inhabitants, um, you know, dominating the Adriatic coast, very cosmopolitan, very... Uh, bustling um, Christian as well, uh, you know, lots of Christianity attested uh, in Salona, um, you know, towards the end of the uh, third century. Um, and so, in that sense, um, you can also, um, well, you see broadening horizons, but because she was a woman and I looked a little bit into the mobility of, of women and so on, and, you know, most of them obviously moved because of a man or what might have happened to Helena because she might have been a prostitute, who knows, she might have been trafficked, um, you know, from, uh, you know, to Nysus, for example. Um, so, it, you know, you kind of get a sense of Helena not just as an empress, but as an imperial subject, experiencing, the, you know, what it means to live in the Roman Empire, you know, not at, at the top uh, level. So that was, uh, you know, a real, real eye-opener for me um, to kind of um, the travel to these places. But I've come to you to talk about the Tetrarchy, so um, I won't stay long uh, with that um, aha um, effect, but show you another one. When I was in Serbia, I visited the National Museum in Belgrade, and there I found this object. Um, so I kind of was wandering around, and uh, I should have read before, you know, what they actually have, because it was really a chance... Uh, uh, fine, because I was a bit like, you know, oh, what's that in that, you know, um, display case? And I looked, and it said, jewelry uh, found in the mausoleum of the mother of Maximinus Daya. And I was like, oh my God, a mother of an emperor with jewelry. And um, so, you know, that, that was, you know, already kind of uh, an, an eye-opener. 
But then I looked at it more closely and I thought, I know this necklace. I, I know it. Um, where I have seen this before and I had seen it before because it is actually similar to the necklaces that are on the famous um, Constantinian ceiling, painted ceiling in Trier, um, which, you know, up here, two, two of the panels uh, with those uh, uh, necklaces. Um, and so the, 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 the necklace of the, the, the mausoleum was found in, uh, well, in a mausoleum uh, in eastern Serbia, which was attached to an imperial palace. And because the imperial palace uh, that it was kind of close to was the, an almost exact copy of the imperial palace of the emperor Galerius, who was a tetrarch, um, it is you, and which also had a mausoleum with a mother in it, as I will come back to. Um, the kind of the, the archaeologists, um, I think it's, it's relatively um, accepted, uh, decided this must have been the palace of Maximinus Daya, who was the nephew of Galerius, and his mother was Galerius' sister. So we have these two mausolea of a mother and, and, a, and a daughter attached to their, their kind of emperor. Um, uh, sons' uh, palaces. The Trier ceiling, uh, by contrast, is uh, dated to the Constantinian period. Usually thought it was part of the Constantinian palace, although there are many kind of theories about it. Um, it's a, a big ceiling that shows uh, four women and, and several bearded men. Um, they, the women were usually seen as or considered to be uh, Constantinian women. So the left or hand side is often identified as Helena and uh, the, this right-hand side as Fausta. These days, people think they're more allegories, um, but everyone agrees that um, their kind of um, appearance, particularly of the uh, left-hand one who is in the center of the ceiling, um, is imperial. So this is what an imperial woman at the time of Constantine looked like, even if it's not one that we can identify or she, she stands for something else. Um, so this is kind of the, the habit of the imperial woman. And she wears a necklace that looks like the necklace of Maximinus Dyer's uh, mother. And there's another link between this jewelry um, and uh, the, um, the, the Maximinus jewelry and the Trier ceiling, which is that we know that Constantine employed uh, goldsmiths from Moisés Superior, so um, uh, uh, what is now Serbia, um, and they probably also made, or oh, these goldsmiths also made the necklace. So, you know, there is a kind of this um, craftsman network moving between uh, Moisés Superior and, um, and Trier. Uh, he has made these fidelity rings, which were uh, certainly made in Naissus, uh, but then there's also um, objects made in Trier, which you know copy um, those those objects. So um, so he, you know it's not inconceivable that he had you know actually made similar jewelry uh, for his own uh, women. So um, I was obviously sort of struck by that find, and I decided there and then I would drag Helena over the thirty year gap by this necklace. Right? So that is you know would become the the way to fill this gap. Um, because there was a connection between her and these tetrachic women who basically filled this gap um, uh, that I needed to fill. Okay, so tetrachic women are usually uh, talked about as being invisible. And um, <coughs> uh, the tetrarchy, which was obviously a college of four emperors um, instituted by Diocletian in 290, when you know he uh, appointed two junior emperors to the already existing uh, two senior emperors, which was him and, and uh, uh, Maxim, Maximian. Um, so the, the, the ideology around the tetrarchy is usually seen as uh, one where um, succession by merit is stressed and also fictitious kinship that associated with the uh, divine or the sacred bonds between, between the four emperors. And... Um, so there are very, usually very little room uh, for women in this because the women were not the women who existed were not um, meant to be mothers of heirs or they were not expected to be mothers of heirs because of the succession would 
um, go by merit, um, also uh, because these men, these tetrarchs, were um, of um, very obscure backgrounds, uh, usually their spouses were quite obscure, so there was no mileage in celebrating women for their links to, you know, the aristocracy or another imperial dynasty, um, and so on, so, you know, they, uh, they didn't serve that function either, as other empresses um, had done. Okay, this is being said about the women of the Tetrarchy, so they're basically invisible. Constantine is often seen as promoting his women. Obviously, we have Helena, um, so you know there's no doubt about that he did that, and he also promoted his wife Fausta, as we will um, see. Um, and um, it has been said, for example, by Manfred Klaus, this was a deliberate break with this tradition of the, the, the Tetrarchy, which came before him. Uh, not celebrating or promoting their women, um, so he would return to an earlier imperial tradition of integrating women into the into imperial um, uh, kind of self uh, uh, presentation. Now, this necklace affair made me doubt uh, that it was so simple uh, because there was a woman who was, you know, quite clearly uh, in a very cel celebratory way uh, buried in a mausoleum with her jewelry. Um, you know, so, you know, I thought, okay, maybe they, we don't actually know her name. She was invisible, certainly in the, so in, in the textual sources, but, um, you know, she certainly existed. Um, so, and, you know, and, and Constantine clearly kind of knew about this, this necklace uh, somehow, or was interested in it. And, and once, when I started looking for tetrarchic women, um, I actually realized um, that it wasn't really so simple, and it's actually a lot, lot more complicated when it came to visibility. Because first of all, um, there are very many of them, uh, about 23 uh, women, uh, between, um, <coughs> you know, two, two, well, you can say, you know, the women that uh, the, the first Hetrax of Diocletian and Maximian were married to, uh, they uh, count, uh, so you can actually have to go back even before 284, uh, when Diocletian became um, emperor, and then you can uh, take it up to, um, I take it up to uh, 324, when Constantine defeats the last of the Tetrarchs, uh, Licinius. So within that uh, period, we know about 23 uh, women. And, um, and of course, because there were four emperors at, you know, at any given time, there were also uh, usually a couple of uh, usurpers. Uh, around and um, and all these emperors had wives and they had daughters. There were a lot of daughters, uh, sisters. Uh, some of them had concubines. Um, so Galerius and Licinius both had concubines. We know they did. Helena is not unique in that um, respect at all. Um, and this graph that has been generated by with this uh, network analysis software actually shows you who uh, connect, who are the big connectors in this kind of family network. And you can see that female, which is F, uh, uh, members are, you know, their, their, the no size of their nodes are quite big because they connect um, the whole network. Um, so when we look at um, this in a, in a different way, I should have brought, brought this as a handout, uh, but I haven't. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's filmed, so you know you can go back to it. So when we look at it at, the, at a different way, uh, you can really see how. Uh, you know, some women really kind of um, connect uh, certain family groups. So what we have here are the family groups of the tetrarchs. These are the senior, the senior senior tetrarchs are Diocletian and Maximian, um, which are you know uh, dark green and, and orange. Uh, those are his families. In uh, 293, two more are appointed uh, as junior emperors: Galerius and Constantius. Uh, Galerius is uh, dark uh, green, and Constantius is. Um, Dark blue, and um, and then in 305, Maximian and Diocletian abdicate, as I'm sure you know, and then uh, Galerius and the Constantius become the senior emperors, and tragically, the biological sons of Maximian and Constantius are not considered, um, but Galerius man manages to get some of his family uh, included because his nephew is becomes his junior emperor, his Caesar, which is the red uh, group over. At the top um, now, um, obviously, in 306, uh, Constantius dies, uh, and um, and it all becomes you know very 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 messy uh, because he appoints Constantine as his em uh, as his successor, so his own son, and Maxentius, who was Maximian's son, usurps power 
uh, in Rome. Maxentius is the linchpin of the tetrarchy. Uh, this network shows that uh, quite clearly because uh, he sits here. Uh, but his, wa his wife, who is Gallio's daughter, is also extremely important for holding you know, these two sides, um, which are also the western and the eastern side of the tetrarchy, um, together. And um, I mean, these links, you know, between them, so the women has been talked about, but you know, it's always said, that, you know, no, but yeah, but they were not visible. They had these roles of linking the men, but they were not visible. But what does visibility actually mean? Um, I think we have a very top-down view on um, on what it means, very much informed by earlier Roman emperors, and uh, we're looking for appearance of peer women in central media, such as coinage and epigraphy accompanying public statuary and um, that all radiating outwards from the city of Rome. But for the Tetrarchy, these rules do not really apply. Um, and I would actually tentatively argue that uh, because these men did not originate from Rome, um, but from the Balkans mainly, their women also don't know, did not originate uh, from Rome, but also they all did not reside in Rome. Um, <coughs> but they resided a bit of everywhere. and. Um, and the women did as well. So for many people in the Roman Empire, this was probably their first chance to live in proximity with an empress um, in you know, one of these cities that were being built up as imperial um, resonance cities. And actually, we do know that in some of these cities, um, these women were visible. So for example, Lactantius, who uh, writes in 315, but has a good idea what happened, uh, in um, in the East because he lived in the East at the time. Um, he writes in The Death of the Persecutors uh, that Diocletian, when he was building up uh, um, uh, Nicomedia as a uh, imperial residence city, built and built and built, and it's all you know very, very bad because the country doesn't like Diocletian, obviously, because he was persecutor. Um, but you know, he but he also says Diocletian built you know, all sorts of things, but a house for his wife, a house for his daughter in the city. And clearly the people who lived in the Comedia did know this as well, that there was a house where an empress was in. If you couldn't see her, you know, there was kind of presence and absence as it was very kind of um, uh, advertised that an, an emperor was, you know, among them. An empress, sorry, or, you know, imperial women were, were, were among them. Actually, um, uh, there's also a... Uh, uh, the description has been found very recently in Salona uh, uh, of a public statue of Galaxian's wife, Prisca, and, um, and has really not made a lot of uh, splashes, and I don't really understand why, um, but everyone who has talked about it has said, okay, yeah, but there was in Salona, and it's not really important because it's not a really important city. Uh, there was this public statue of, of Galaxian's wife, but... Mm, uh, but, you know, in Salona, people had the chance to go and look at this statue, and it was very visible. The wife of Diocletian was very uh, visible. Some of these cities were extremely small, uh, like Trier, and, um, uh, and you know, it just, you know, and then this imperial court arrives, and in Trier, the thir a third of the city is built up as the imperial palace. And um, Theodora, Constantius' wife, the one he leaves Helena for, probably lives in Trier. She has three daughters as well. She actually, actually has six children. And um, she lives there for many years. Um, and, you know, there is no way that these inhabitants of Trier did not know that they were neighbors of an empress. Um, so I think we need to think a little bit um, about that. Also, we need to think about that the Tretrochy was a process and came in stages. Um, and uh, maybe the women weren't very invisible at the beginning, which, you know, fine, I buy that argument. But from 306, it all became quite different um, because in 306, um, the Tetrarchy started to fragment um, to us. You know, I think the men at the time, they were still very much invested in the idea, you know, of the Imperial College and so on. And they were sort of striking these alliances um, and so on, but you know, there's no doubt about it um, that um, you know this kind of super dynastic uh, collective idea was starting to lose um, its appeal, and within this, the women start to reappear both in the West and in the East, um, because emperors kind of start to refocus their attention on their own families and building up dynasties um, as kind of power bases and so on. So in the West, um, 
uh, for example, we uh, see uh, an alliance between Constantine, um, who you know was appointed emperor by his dying father, and then the the, uh, the military claimed him as well. You know, but he wasn't accepted uh, by Galerius, who was the senior emperor. Um, and he then strikes an alliance with uh, Maxentius, who had observed power in Rome uh, and had brought back his dad, Maximian. So these three men, um, you know, get together, and this alliance is cemented by another um, uh, woman, um, Maximian's daughter, Fausta, uh, Maxentius' sister. She becomes Constantine's uh, wife, and um, that, you know, in itself is not so uh, surprising. We've seen that before. Um, but what is surprising is um, that coins are minted for her. Um, and uh, so this um, half Argenteus uh, is minted in Trier uh, on the occasion probably of her wedding in 307 to Constantine. That cements this alliance between these imperial men in the West. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we really too little talked about, but this is the first coin with a portrait of an appeal woman in 25 years. And people then say, oh, yeah, but it was a very small emission because it was only in Trier, only coin, two coins are known. Um, but then again, it was in Trier where another empress had lived for quite some time. Um, so, you know, who knows you know, who, who this kind of um, uh, statement was uh, addressed to. Um, and certainly in Trier, people were quite... Um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, quite familiar uh, with, the, with the imperial women. Um, okay, so, so that happens in, uh, in the West. Um, I think it's quite much under Maximian's, uh, not Constantine's, um, agenda uh, to, to, to mint this coin. Um, and that has also actually been said because um, Fausta on this coin has a button nose. Uh, and Maximian is usually also represented with a button nose, so she's represented as Maximian's daughter, who he gives to Constantine in the wedding speech that we have. Um, quite shockingly, for Tetrarchic uh, speeches, uh, Fausta's motherhood is invoked, and you know the hope that there will be heirs and so on. That's all totally new uh, for for the Tetrarchy, but very much to be read within that context of, of fragmenting, uh, um, you know, Tetrarchic um, ideology. So she also has this uh, title, Nobilissima Femina, um, which is a new title for Tetrarchic women. It's not entirely new for Fausta because on that inscription that I mentioned of Prisca, Diocletian's wife from Salona, she's also called a Nobilissima Femina and, um, and Maxentius' wife um, is as well. So this is a, a kind of a new title um, for probably for the relatives of the senior empress. Okay, um, but a more remarkable uh, change was afoot um, in the east, um, where kind of Galerius was uh, the senior um, emperor. And um, now Galerius always comes across as very family oriented um, already, or the most one, even of the original kind of tetrarchs, um, with some quirks, because he famously, <coughs> as I said, inserts his nephew Max Max Maximinus into the succession who becomes his junior emperor in 305. Um, he, um, so he, he, he seems to be kind of dynasty building, but, but using mainly kind of the, uh, his uh, maternal relatives, so kind of his sister, but also his mother um, for, um, for that. But he's also married to, uh, to Valeria, who's Diocletian's uh, daughter. And, um, and then Valeria also adopts uh, his son, his illegitimate son that he had with a concubine. Um, so he actually does have a son. And um, so there's a, there's a lot of interesting dynasty building going on around uh, Galerius, which is kind of at, at, at the top uh, there. And, um, and then, you know, exactly like in the West, uh, after 306, um, all of a sudden women start to uh, uh, reappear. And, um, after a conference uh, held with you know all the kind of remaining you know men that Galerius thought might be legitimate uh, on the Danube at Canuntum, he makes his wife um, Augusta. So Valeria, the daughter of Diocletian, becomes Augusta in around 308, and he starts minting coins for her. 
And while this is acknowledged, it's actually not acknowledged how many coins he mints, Galerius mints for uh, Valeria, because he is here. Okay, not as many as others, but you know, not not very few either. And certainly a lot more than Constantine mints for his wife Fausta later. Constantine he was allegedly the you know promoter of, of, of his women. So Galerius is um, is very much ahead of him with um, uh, coinage. Um, <coughs> so about 8% of his known coinage output were minted for Valeria. Um, and statues of Valeria were also set up in public places. We have um, at least four inscriptions, all from the East, obviously, um, for her. So that's all well and good. It's rarely discussed, though. Um, but there's a lot more going on uh, with imperial women um, in the Tetrarchy, and particularly in the East, um, and some of it was decidedly innovative and without precedent. Now, first of all, um, what was really innovative is what Galerius and Maximinus did to their mothers. Um, coming back to kind of the mausoleum and, and, and where the jewelry um, had been found. Um, so both of them, uh, and they were mother and daughter, were buried in, um, in mausolea attached to uh, the rural palaces um, of their sons, in East, now in eastern Serbia. And the material culture uh, suggests that both have been deified uh, or consecrated upon death. Because on both sides, um, the mausolea are accompanied by still existing or preserved uh, funeral pyres. So the funeral pyres had also been preserved um, at, you know, at the time. And, and, and they form an architectural unity um, with the mausoleum. And then also, which I found kind of amazing, uh, kind of find, that these two mausolea are about 40 kilometers from each other. Um, fairly close, but they are on parallel lines. So um, they are both orientated, you know, in their kind of architectural orientation, towards the rise of Orion on winter solstice day, um, both of them. And on parallel lines, um, and the mausoleum of Maximus' mother was built after the one for Galer Galeria's mother, which was called Romola. Um, so, you know, clearly, you know, the architects there, you know, looked at, you know, the orientation of, of Romola's mausoleum and, um, and uh, built uh, her daughter's mausoleum um, in exactly uh, the same way. Um, and Galerius would actually use ma mausoleum is also um, uh, here, near, near Romola's, near his mother's. Later built, though, it's also on this um, orientation. And um, probably kind of meant to facilitate uh, the, the, the journey of the soul towards the divine on winter solstice day, you know, towards kind of a rear. Um, and uh, in, in Romulus' case, we know the site was focused on her commemoration because it is actually called after her. The whole site is called Felix Romuliana, um, so it was clearly um, a commemoration site um, for her. And we know that from an inscription, and also there are lots of peacocks around um, in Galeria's uh, palace, so in the decoration, and the, the peacock is the uh, bird of the um, apotheosis of the empress. Um, so the mausoleum was probably built uh, after Galerius had become uh, senior Augustus, the so senior emperor in 305, and possibly early after the events of 306, so Roman's mausoleum and Maximinus' mausoleum, or his mother's mausoleum, then, um, then afterwards. Um, but actually, even before, um, Galerius seems to have instrumentalized his mother to enhance his own divine associations, because Lactantius tells us, okay, this might be the Lennox, but who knows, um, that uh, Galerius claimed after he had a victory against the Persians in 298 that he had actually been conceived uh, by a um, uh, sexual intercourse that Romulan had had with Mars. Uh, so that he was actually the son of a god, and um, and in that way, you know, superior to the other tetrarchs. So he was quite, um, quite he's a quite interesting uh, person, and the, you know, the most dynasty building of all the uh, tetrarchs. All of that is interesting, but it's also extraordinary for Roman emperors um, because um, these women were from completely obscure backgrounds. Romola was actually from Dacia. 
uh, so across the Danube and had fled uh, over the Danube um, by a, you know, to escape an incursion of the Carpi, so around 250s, around the, yeah, so a lot earlier, um, and then had probably been resettled in rural uh, uh, Dacia Repensis. Um, so, you know, and then, you know, Lacantius always says, oh, they were all peasants and, um, you know, um, um, cattle um, shepherds um, and so on. And, uh, that, you know, it's polemical on one level, but it's not inconceivable that that actually was what happened because these men had military careers and, um, and that's how they became um, emperors. So, so they are obscure, these mothers, and no emperor really ever had um, promoted an obscure mother. And actually, uh, generally, um, em empress before Galerius um, were quite reluctant uh, to uh, um, talk about their mothers, you know, on, on kind of central media like coinage uh, and so on. Um, and certainly not if the only mothers who had also had an imperial connection had either been empresses or had been daughters of, or you know, nieces um, of empress um, and so on. Um, and the only exceptions are um, Julia Soemias, the mother of. Elagabalus and Julia Mamea, the mother of Alexander Severus, um, but these are already connected to the Severian dynasty, so they are not you know, as obscure as these. Um, so no deified or consecrated um, dead imperial mother was as obscure as Romola, and she was also the first imperial woman who had been deified after a 50-year gap. And what is more, and this is really important to me, is that no imperial woman had ever been buried in a single occupancy mausoleum. So imperial women had obviously been buried in an imperial mausoleum, but always with their men. Um, actually, you know, usually all the dynasties would be buried together, like in the mausoleum of Hadrian or the mausoleum of Augustus. And, um, and any woman who had been not um, buried with their menfolk was a disgraced woman like Agrippina. She had been buried elsewhere. She was later transferred, transferred to the mausoleum of, of Augustus. So this was, you know, totally new uh, doing uh, what these, these guys did uh, with their mother. And also no emperor had ever claimed that their, this, his mom had slept with a god. Um, so, um, so all of this was hugely experimental, what Galerius did, but also not so invisible because these dominate the landscape in eastern Serbia. You know, could be seen from afar. They're all both kind of on a higher, kind of like a, on the slope of a hill above the imperial palace. Um, okay, so that's one innovation. Another innovation is um, how these women actually looked like. And uh, coming back to the necklace. Um, now, uh, well, presented how they looked like, obviously on coins, but given the finds in Maximina's mother's mausoleum, they actually may have in reality looked like uh, this, uh, because Valeria Galeria on, um, oh, Valeria, Galerius gives her, her name, his name as well, Galeria Valeria, uh, wears a necklace on this coin and on, on many of her other coins. Um, and perhaps, well, it's perhaps more jeweled collar. She also wears a so-called pala contabulata, um, which is a, um, a ceremonial embroidered and, and probably multicolored mantle, uh, which is draped di diagonally over her chest. And her hair <coughs> is potentially styled into something that German art historians call the Zopfkranz frisur, um, which is a braid wound around uh, the head. Um, now, this is a bit disputed because other people think what she actually has on her head is a wreath. Um, Okay, again, this is extraordinary because very, very few empresses emperors before Valeria were represented as wearing jewelry and or, you know, anything that was not a plain uh, pala. Um, maybe there were di diadem, but, you know, not even all of them did. Um, and this was usually because of the, well, this was because of the normative discourse that um, Roman empresses were to set a model for female behavior and female behavior should be modest and sober and um, and respectable and not draw attention to a woman's body with, as jewelry and you know and very kind of uh, colorful um, uh, clothes would do. Um, so uh, 
this idea had gone out of the window because uh, Valeria, you know, looks very kind of um, bejeweled. Um, she isn't the very first uh, woman, though, uh, because um, this woman, who is an obscure empress uh, of the emperor just before Diocletian, is also wearing uh, the same kind of a similar outfit. Um, she's called Magna Urbica. Um, and she was also an Augusta, or made Augusta, and, um, but she's the very, very first uh, imperial woman who looks like this. I have no idea what happened there. Um, other than um, that, you know, the third century was obviously a century where a lot of uh, peripher perif peripheral um, customs uh, were coming to the foreground, and, uh, and of course, Women all around the Roman Empire were wearing jewelry. We know this. Um, I mean, you have to think about Palmyra, for example. You know, which you know, the the women are just so bejeweled um, that um, you know it's like, like dazzling. Um, so um, so you know, there, there might have been just something about um, you know Roman emperors actually copying or starting to copy or starting to adapting um, other customs than you know the central moral uh, discourse was uh, was dictating. Um, but it's certainly, um, uh, you know, something new uh, and also uh, something that we can also see on statuary. Uh, this is the statue which has been found in Canuntum, uh, where that famous Tetrarchy conference was held in 300, November 308. Um, and lots and lots and lots of interpretations. Uh, but one interpretation is that this is a Tetrarchic empress, possibly even Valeria. Uh, it was found in the legionary fort. Uh, Valeria was also made Marta Castrorum, so the, the, the mother of the ports, um, which is a, a, a standard empress title. Um, and uh, this could be her as well. You know, she, she you know wears the same um, same outfit, and of course, she wears the necklace. Uh, you know, with the big medallions. This uh, statue uh, does as well. Okay, so now you probably think, okay, what has all of that uh, to do with Helena, and when is she finally coming to an end? Um, now, uh, it's important to look at where and when Helena reappeared, because, as I said, lots of historians say, oh, yeah, of course, Constantine loved Helena and wanted to have her with her wherever he was, and, um, and so on. Uh, but the fact is that Helena makes her first public appearance on a coin, and the coin, um, oh, sorry, um, I come back to that, and the coin is um, uh, minted in Thessalonica in 318, when Constantine, by now at war with the last uh, Tetrarch Licinius, <coughs> has defeated Licinius. Licinius vacates these territories of the Balkans, and Constantine moves in and he strikes coins with the portrait of his, of his mother, but also his wife, so both of them with the Tetrarchic era title, um, Nobilissima Femina, and, um, and in Thessalonica, which had been the main residence of Galerius, and had also been, and now I need to go back, um, uh, the place where Valeria had been killed um, because Valeria, uh, you know, after Galerius dies in 311, um, she has a bit of a hard, well, she has a very, very hard time because both Maximinus and, you know, Licinius, who has come onto the scene um, in, the, in the meantime, uh, well, you know, well, Maximinus tries to marry her and then she doesn't want to and he exiles her, she escapes, um, and then she kind of uh, wanders around with her mother, Prisca, and then she comes to Thessalonica, and in Thessalonica, she is apprehended because people know, I guess, you know, what she looks like, because, you know, this is where she uh, resided, or have resided, and, um, you know, and there were statues of her, and, and so on. Not that the statues necessarily looked like um, Valeria, but this is, I think, a good, um, good example also um, to show that these people probably sometimes did go out in public and, you know, and did engage, you know, face to face uh, with someone. And then she's killed. And, and executed, and it is exactly in this place that um, Constantine uh, uh, mints this coin um, with the portrait of Helena and with this title, uh, you know, quite pointed to Trachic title. 
by um, 304, um, uh, Helena and Fausta, you know, the Constantine's wife, are also Augusta. At this point, uh, uh, Licinius is defeated completely, um, and uh, you know that the women are really kind of um, promoted empire-wide on coins minted a bit everywhere. Uh, but they also wear jewels, and they uh, wear this top Franz frisur, and they wear the Palla Contabulata, which is um, on this coin. Faust is in, in um, here. She's in, standing between um, Constantine's son Crispus, so uh, older son, not her son, and her older son, but in that 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 mantle, uh, that embroidered mantle. Um, so that is um, it, it maybe just convention. Um, you know, that this is just how, you know, uh, empresses are now represented, but certainly constantly also kind of all, all his mints uh, learned that from uh, what uh, Galerius um, had done. Um, so, uh, so, you know, they, they kind of lo look like to tragic women, if, if you want to call this to tragic women, or how, how women, how imperial women looked like uh, by now. Um, but Constantine was still in the business of appropriating uh, tetrarchic uh, uh, women kind of back into kind of his own dynasty because he also mints coins of his sister, Constantia, who had been married to uh, Licinius. Once Licinius is defeated, or possibly once he then is killed, um, he very pointedly mints coins. Uh, with the portrait of uh, Constantia, with Sopkan Squizur, with the title of Nobilis, Nobilisma Femina, um, and so on. So, you know, he was still, you know, very much responding uh, to, um, you know, to what has been going on, because uh, these, this is a very, another very small emission, just in Constantinople, but obviously this is where Licinius had fled. He had fled to Byzantium uh, with Constantia. Um, we do know that, uh, and his son. Um, so, you know, as soon as Constantine moves in, he mints a coin uh, and saying, well, actually, this woman belongs to me. She's my sister. She's not uh, Licinius' uh, wife. Um, and again, I can't help thinking that people in, in Byzantium um, actually did know about uh, Constantia and had to be told, uh, you know, that, okay, well, she's not going to get killed, but, you know, she's also not, not kind of giving legitimacy to... Um, Licinius anymore, his son. Okay, so um, when Helena dies, um, she is uh, also buried in a mausoleum. And again, it's a single occupancy uh, mausoleum. It is in Rome. Um, by this time, Fausta is dead because Constantine has probably killed her. And, um, and she is styled as the ancestress of um, the Constantinian dynasty, as genetrics. Um, which again is is quite uh, interesting for uh, you know an amazingly obscure woman. Um, there are a lot of inscriptions from Rome, um, but they probably uh, so this inscription is is now at Santa Croce um, is is probably from a statue group that shows Constant showed Constantine his sons and Helena because they are mentioned on, on the inscription. Um, and she's mentioned as their, their grandmother. It doesn't even mention Constantius anymore. So it's a very kind of narrow line from Helena to Constantine and then the sons. And um, she is, as I said, you know, from a very obscure background. And you know, and people have talked about that. You know how you know, uh, all, you know, almost um, inconceivable it is. But when we think about what Galerius did, um, it's not all that different. Um, of course, Constantine did different things. With Helena, um, so for example, he put her on coins. Galerius never um, put his his uh, mother Romola, uh, her portrait on a coin. Um, he buries Helena in Rome, not in kind of on the periphery in, in eastern uh, Serbia, and um, uh, and he did something else. Okay, of course, yeah, of course, he said so to Jerusalem <laughs> to, to build churches, and the Tetrarchs obviously never did that as well. Um, so in some sense, he was an innovator, and that graph here is actually, I, I find, quite striking to show, you know, how few emperors had actually commemorated their mothers, um, and, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the severians are, you know, quite up there um, with, with all the Julias. 
uh, and then in the, in the early empire we get a few, but otherwise, um, you know, emperors were actually not that interested in their mothers, um, and certainly not their portraits or coins. But Constantine did do that, and um, and that's you know a, even a step further than what Galerius and uh, and Maximinus had done uh, to their mother. <coughs> okay, I'll finish here, but just with um, a little sentence about. Helena herself, because obviously I started the talk with her, you know, the memorable event in Helena's life and so on, and, um, and now I have actually only talked about her representation. Um, you know, that will you know, probably dominate this, you know, my kind of 30-year gap uh, uh, narrative. Um, but was being brought back to court you know, on a coin a memorable event uh, in, 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 in Helena's life? Well, I think, yes, because what happened to women usually was that they disappeared. Um, so, you know, the man divorces a uh, uh, wife, she disappears, and, and the new wife takes the place, and, you know, they, they go on, and maybe there's another, and the third wife, and so on. I think it's very, very rare that we see in, his, in Roman history a wife who has been cast aside and then returns and has to actually sit with these women that had replaced her because Theodora was probably still alive, so the woman who you know had replaced her. Her sister Fausta was the one that, you know, she was like the double act with Helena. And I mean, I can't help thinking that that must have been extremely difficult. And um, so in that sense, I think we can get you know back to you know experience um, as well, which is you know the, I guess, the lifeblood of writing biography. Okay, I'll finish. Thank you.